So if you're applying to medicine or dentistry this summer and maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed or just want to know what you can do in this short time to really elevate your application and give yourself the best chance of getting in, check out this video here where I've just done a webinar talking through kind of all the things that you need to do to maximize that time to take your application to the next level. So we're talking everything about aptitude tests, so UCAT, GAMSAT, personal statement, work experience, choosing the right medical schools, basically everything that you need to build a really, really strong application. And then at the end, I talk about where you can get the best resources and the best help to help you individually with your application to maximize your chance of success. So enjoy this long conversation and long talk, giving you everything that you need to know to make this summer really count towards helping you get into medical or dental school. So well, welcome, like I said, welcome to this talk. This is about Really, so really for people who are applying to uh, medical or dental school and you're considering submitting your application this autumn, so you know, start of September is when the UCAS application opens, and then of course you have the um, then you have the deadline, which is actually usually always the 15th of October, but this year it's the 16th. Um, but essentially you have that time to complete really what is the culmination of all the preparation for your med school application and i'll talk about what the the distinguishing features between that and what happens after that but essentially now is the time when it kind of all comes together it can be quite stressful it can uh, feel like there's a lot going on it can be a little bit overwhelming so really this talk is to help you understand what to do this summer where to place your focus to make the most of it and try and make it as as uh, little stress as possible. So uh, just to get the formalities out of the way, my name is Dr. Hilton. Well, Dr. Ash, as you probably guys, you guys probably have seen me um, on YouTube, but I, um, I basically went into medicine and dentistry in both, both of them, the most competitive way that you can do it. So even from when I was applying, I was very methodical and kind of tried to understand the crux of what makes a successful application. So then when I was at medical school, I started helping people um, kind of optimize their applications. And that's where the, the foundations of Future Doc, the company where we help people today started. But since I've been a, um, a admissions kind of application admissions expert and sat on interview panels and all that sort of stuff. And then I decided I wanted to go into a very niche type of surgery called maxillofacial surgery. And to do that, you have to hold both degrees in medicine and dentistry. So lo and behold, I applied all of the stuff that I uh, have learned and was teaching all my students and put it into a very um, competitive dental school application, which was only for um, medics wanting to go into maxillofacial surgery. Only course in Europe had 10 places. Um, and yeah, essentially I, uh, to put all of this stuff into practice and, and manage to get a place on that. So it's good to see that the, the proof is in the pudding. But um, anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about you guys. Um, so we talked about, we've already talked about what your biggest concern is. And um, ultimately, we, we, I saw that essentially probably 90% of the comments in the chat were for uh, your biggest concern is about the UCAT. So explain to, so let's take a moment. Why don't you guys in the chat, the ones who've put UCAT and the ones who haven't put UCAT, if UCAT is your biggest concern, tell me what it is about the UCAT that you're worried about. It, anything specifically that we can dive into later that will help you guys make the most out of this summer. So I'll give you a minute just to, um, yeah, just anything in the chat that you want to, want me to touch on specifically. Uh, yeah, someone saying it's not like any exam I've revised for. Exactly, it's, that's very true. Uh, how to revise and how to start revising. Okay, great. Yeah, that's no problem at all. We can talk about that. Um, anything else? How many weeks to revise? Brilliant. Yeah, that's, we, we will cover that. Scores stagnant, not improving. Okay, I'll talk about that as well. QR. Okay, QR is my weakest. Sorry, just for the recording. Um, how to prepare for the UCAT, which course to buy for the UCAT, there are lots of courses, but uh, haven't done strict timing. Uh, it's very different and I don't know whether it's too late to start. It's definitely not too late to start. Don't worry about that. Um, AR is my weakest, time management. Okay, no problem. So what I'll do is I will talk through all the things that we need to be focusing on. And we, what we'll do is have a bit of time for Q&A after. And, and we, can, we can talk specifically about um, 
techniques and stuff for um for, for different sections of the ucat um but I'll, I'll cover the the thing that i want you guys to realize is that and if you've seen any of my other talks uh, i'm not sure if you guys follow does everybody follow my youtube channel because a lot of this stuff is answered in there and i'll post the link in the chat now for where to um check out some of that stuff because I, I basically have specific videos to answer all of those questions individually but um what what i often say with regards to the ucat is that it is um it it's often underestimated in terms of the speed and the accuracy that you need to have to score highly but then a lot of people because you kind of have two camps of people when they're applying people go in relatively unaware and people who go in quite aware and the unaware people tend to not realize just how speedy you have to be to do well in the UCAT so it kind of catches them off guard and unfortunately a lot of the time they either find out too late or they only find out when they sit the exam and get their score and think oh gosh that was really quick um on the other hand um they oh thank you uh for <laughs> thank someone said uh, my instagram's worth following too uh so thank you for that and posted the instagram link there's also the tiktok as well the tiktok's probably um where we put well we're, we're always put a lot of effort into the youtube and obviously the instagram but we're, we're focusing a lot on tiktok at the moment so um check out all of those they all add different value in different ways that suits those platforms anyway um sorry so you've got those two types of, you've got people who kind of get taken by surprise and you get the people who know what they're letting themselves in for now those people tend to overvalue the UCAT so they understand and they, and they get a bit over bit get too worked up about it because they know how stressful it can be but then they think that it's the be all and end all of the application and it's a big part I'm not denying that but you know every year on the future program we get people who come to us who didn't get a great score and you know we still get them into medical school because it's about the other elements as well and you know being intelligent about where you apply based on your UCAT score it, there are so many pieces to this puzzle and yes probably the UCAT is I mean I would argue that the interview is the biggest one because that is the one where people really you know a lot of people can engineer a good UCAT score and not particularly make themselves great applicants and then you get found out at interview phase so I would say that probably the UCAT and the interview are the two biggest pieces but they are not the entire picture and please please whatever you do don't fall into the trap of thinking that you know personal statement for example a lot of people think is really important and it, that really will depend on what universities you go to but it's the things that make a good personal statement literally the act of you building yourself into a good applicant by virtue of the things that you have done that would go into your personal statement that actually make you a good applicant right so it's not necessarily how good the personal statement itself is it's how good the person putting those things into the personal statement it is and and essentially we're going to talk about that now to to give a really well-rounded application which is well-rounded is the term that you'll hear a lot of medical schools say they want to see well-rounded applicants um duh, duh, duh. someone's asked me uh, if i give feedback on personal statements i do for people on the program i don't do it for anybody else because we get you know uh, it would be too overwhelming because it takes me about uh, for, for personal statement reviews i do about um an hour-long video of me going through it and talking through all the important points so um yeah we I, I don't only do that for people on the program so uh i've actually already answered this question but let's just for fun and just to make sure everybody is uh awake and with us uh let's launch a poll uh so let's see what's most important so which so which of these what's most important so I've got here the options are traits and academics, uh, work experience, aptitude test, personal statement, interviews, uh, choosing the right medical schools, and yeah, that, that, that's all the options. So we've got, you've got, I'll give you 40 seconds to answer this, and then we'll go through and we'll share the poll as well, share the answers. So about half of you voted. I'll give you another 10, well, sorry, uh, I'll give you another. 25 seconds. Be good to have some uh, elevator music now while we're while we're waiting for this. 
Got that. Ten more seconds. Just a few of you, about five of you haven't voted. Okay, cool. Three, two, one. Okay, we'll end it there. So, lo and behold, we have seen that, so 38% um, think that the aptitude test is the most important, interviews, um, and the truth is, is, it's a trick question really, because they are all as important. It's like saying to somebody, you know, what's the, the most important organ in your body? Well, you know, you're losing your heart would probably kill, well, losing your brain or your heart would probably kill you first, but if you lost your liver, you'd be pretty screwed. And, you know, if you didn't have lungs, you'd be pretty screwed as well. So, you know, it's all, it's all a, a relative thing, but actually, you know, they're all very important and they all make, as what we said, a great rounded application. So, um, what I want to kind of quickly explain to you. So this video here, I do two, two versions of this video. I do a short video of the four phases of medical application on my YouTube channel. And in fact, in the emails building up to this, I did link to this video. So I do two videos. I do one where I kind of do a quick YouTube style summary, but I also do another one where it's just me. I think I talk for about 30 minutes without stopping and just riff on, or on these four phases and, and the, how to set up the application. So to formalize it, here, so here are the four phases of the medical application. Now, obviously, we are in phase three, which is crunch time. Now, if anybody's applying next year, um, you've come at a very good time because, you know, in September, you know, if you're in about to enter year 12, if you're about to enter um, your penultimate year, so second year of uh, university, uh, well, if you're assuming you're doing a three year degree, so whatever your penultimate year is, um, that is the time to really start thinking about the medical application and really is the time where um yeah like you, you want to start the preparation really but you know every year on like i say on the future doc program we always get people who come to us at this phase who are a who maybe have kind of neglected these two phases a little bit uh, or just have done them but just don't feel that comfortable or just you know they, they're doing everything but they just want that little bit more support they want to make sure that they optimizing the way that they're doing stuff, maximizing their chances. We know how competitive it is now. They just want to make sure they're doing everything right. So phase one is like more putting all the big rocks in place in terms of your work experience, um, building a great CV, all that sort of stuff. Then um, we, we're thinking towards phase two about getting towards the, the getting ready for this crunch time really. So you've probably got your um, exams going on, we've got the aptitude test, we start thinking about our personal statement. But now is when all of that culminates. So we'll sit those tests that we uh, want, essentially we piece everything together to submit our application. So we sit those tests that we were preparing for, we finalize and write our personal statement. University selection is so, so important. And we're gonna to touch on that today. You know, you can take the exact two same students on paper. Again, this is why, um, we have a lot of success on the program is because you, know, you take two exactly the same students, you know, same UCAT score, same academics, uh, same level of work experience, you know, all of those things. And you just, you put one person to this, these four medical schools and you apply to these four medical schools with the other person and you see the difference in the offers that people get and how, the, how many interview offers and so on and so forth. So, so important. Um, so this is when, so we might have done some internships or we might have, we might actually be doing our work experience just as a show of hands quickly in the chat, yes or no, or Y or N, tell me who is doing work experience over the summer that's, that's actually applying in September. So if you're applying in September, yes or no, are you doing some, uh, or, or I guess no would be if you've already completed it. You've already done it in the run-up. So literally everybody, uh, okay. So, so, so I guess some people are saying yes and no, which means that they're doing some, but they've already done some, uh, already done, yeah. So, but a lot of people, majority, so look in the chat, majority of people, yes, yes, yes. So essentially, a lot of the preparation phase is getting the you know your ducks in a row to to really execute on this so this is why i say to people the earlier you start 
uh, the more you can impact your application because it's just a lot of it is just time and effort. Um, so someone said, what's the ideal amount of work experience? We're going to talk about that as well later. So, um, okay, so let's move on. So this is what the, the phases one and two are all about becoming the kind of person that will make a good doctor. Now, again, like I say, we're at the stage where it's crunch time and we're just putting this all together. So like a lot of you've said, you, will, you know, this summer we'll be completing our work experience. We'll be sitting some exams. We'll be confirming our university choices. We'll be um, writing and finalizing our personal statement alongside getting a really good tutor reference. Don't forget that. And then we'll put it all together in, in the submission. Um, and this is the bit where, like I say, it can be a bit stressful and people do get a bit, um, a bit overwhelmed by this. And I think it's helpful to realize that a lot of people feel like that. So don't worry too much. Um, so let's go, let's talk about work experience first. And like I say, I know that UCAT is a big part of it for a lot of people, but let's talk about that first. Let's talk about work experience first while we're on the subject. Um, so let's do another poll just to keep everybody feeling like they're part of it. So um, where's my work experience one? I do, here we go, just do a, launch this. So work experience, how many different type of work experience make a strong application? So essentially what type of work experience is there? So again, I'll give you a minute. I've got 36 people here. Let's, um, let's get everybody voting. Okay, again, I'm not going to sing any elevator music. It would be great if I had some queued up there. Maybe some countdown music would be good. Okay, five people haven't voted. Um, I'll give you 10 more seconds and then I will share the results. Okay, and while we're waiting, in the chat, so the people who have written the types of, of the number of work experience types that you have, tell me what, what are the types then? Type them in, show, show me what you think they are. If you've written two, what are the two types? If you've written three, what are the three types? And four, et cetera, et cetera. So, right, I've ended the poll. Let's see, so. So I'll share with you the results. Most people think that there are two types of work experience. Okay, so we've got things like HCA, care work, volunteering, ser service type work experience, support worker shadowing a doctor, in practice online volunteering, volunteering, paid work and shadowing. Let's keep going. Okay, perfect. So, um, Let's see, I'm, I'm going to give you a shout out. Uh, Aisha, you got it right. So it's three, what we would broadly categorize as three types of work experience. Now, if you check out this video here on my YouTube channel, I go through this in a lot of depth and um, I'd recommend having a look. It's like a 20 minute video, but it will really give you a comprehensive idea of the amount of time the number of different types of, of things that you should do and really what makes a complete and rounded um, kind of amount of work experience, if we want to call it that. Um, let me, so I think, okay, well, so what I'll do, I'll just leave this on here, but um, let me unshare for a minute so I can just talk to you guys because I'll, um, it'll be, we'll talk about this for a little bit of time. So with work experience, you have the three types, right? So a lot of people think of work experience as shadowing. Shadowing is just a type of work experience. So shadowing is the one where you go into hospital, GP practice, and you know, ideally one of those, but you know, there are other ways that you can shadow doctors. But essentially that is where you are uh, going in and seeing that you're a fly on the wall and you're seeing what it's like. You're not doing anything. You're literally just observing. You know, if you have the chance to, you can ask the doctors questions, you can speak to the patients, but essentially you're not really doing much other than just observing and trying to soak up as much of the experience of what a doctor is like to understand the realities of it. And hopefully, uh, it, you know, it opens your eyes and helps you, this helps you decide that it's truly something that you want to do. For some people, the reality is that it's not for them and, and it is hot and being a doctor is hard. Some people, it helps them realize that it's not what they want to do. And that's why it's so important to 
as part of the weeding process, they, you know, interviewers want to see that you have gone in, you understand what the, what the job, because essentially this applying to medicine is a, is a five year, six year long job application, right? You're just getting ready to do the job of becoming a doctor. And they want to see that you understand what you're letting yourself in for. You understand the realities of it. You've picked up some tips of how you're going to be able to cope with some of the stresses that come with it, all of the above. So that is really, I would say, a either a one and done or a two and done type of experience, right? You go and you can either do it in hospital, you can do it in a GP practice, but essentially what you need is, is two weeks, so 80 hours of time shadowing. Now for a lot of, so that's, that is what I would say is, is my guideline. Now, one of the great resources that you can use to use as a benchmark is the Warwick, um, the Warwick work experience guide. Warwick are probably the strictest when it comes to work experience. And yes, they are a graduate only university, but it is a great guideline for anybody applying and it kind of serves for them. It's a minimum, but for most, I would say, because they are the most strict, you know, this is exactly how my mentality for every, every element of the med school application, we want to go to the most challenging one. And if we're good enough for them, then we're good enough for everybody else. And that's the attitude I have throughout everything in my, in the program. Right? So, um, so, with the Warwick guide, it will give you explicitly, like literally very, very explicit guide, uh, hours and, um, you know, guidance on what they want to see to, to make a really good application. Now for them, it's a cutoff. You, you have to have that and you also have to have evidence of it. But for the, for most people, for, other than the ones that want to see registered hours, the work, ex the shadowing particularly, sorry, is not really so much about what you did. It's about what you got out of it. So probably the most important tip I will give you for your shadowing is to keep a diary and don't think that you can just remember all of it and write it down three weeks later. Keep a really accurate contemporaneous so at the time diary because, you know, it's the nature of humans and the nature of memory. People forget and then the the really good stuff that you've learned is the detail. It's the, okay, we went to see an operation. What did the patient have? Why did we operate this way? Why did, you know, what was the, so they had a hernia. What specific type of hernia was it? And they did this to help deal with it. Why did they do that? Because I went away and spoke, or I spoke to the doctor after, to the surgeon after, and they said, um, there are different types of hernia. And actually, because it's this type of hernia, we had to do, we had to go about it this way. You know, these are the sort of details that when you come to interview or when you come to write your personal statement, people will, that's the good stuff that really makes it stand, makes a good story stand out. It's a bit like when you have someone who's a great storyteller. I've, I've got a friend who's a journalist and he can weave some of the best yarns because he, he can eliminate the unnecessary detail, get to the point, but he can tell you the detail that really like brings you into the, to the scene and, and really helps you visualize what's going on. Um, so um, yeah, when it comes to shadowing, so like I say, 80 hours, um, I would say, again, it's, it's more about what you got out of it than what you did. So going to see it, going to shadow a really fancy, um, in a really fancy hospital, seeing a really prestigious professor isn't, and, and just name, thinking that name dropping is going to get you, um, is going to like impress people that's not going to work as well as somebody who's gone to your run of the mill hospital and has really taken the time to understand what they've seen reflect on it extract some really meaningful experience and value and lessons out of it so remember that it's the detail and the reflection of your work experience that is much greater than your um than what you do so what what you get out of it is much more important than what you do now, when we talk about those 80 hours, I would typically say, I mean, again, there are, there are very few universities that will actually count the hours and want to see it, but you can usually get a good idea of, of whether people have actually done stuff when they speak about it and they can tell you a number of experiences and a number of things that they've seen. So for most people, it's not actually the number of hours, it's more what you get out of it. But if you are trying to, if you do need to, like say, if you are applying to Warwick or one of the universities that do have 
very strong, um, you know, a strong requirement, then I would recommend that you do one, two different experiences, one week in maybe a GP practice, or one week in a hospital, or maybe you could do both weeks in hospital and do one in a surgical specialty, one in a medical specialty, and that way it give you a nice variety and lots of different things to talk about. And when you present yourself in your personal statement and in your interview, you're saying like, well, actually I learned about teamwork and leadership when I did this work experience in, in, in surgery, but then I also learned about the importance of confidentiality when I did this other experience in, in a medical, on a medical ward. Really important to have that, those distinguishing elements that really, when someone's reading, they go, oh, wow, so they've learned this in this, but then they've also done this as well. And, you know, it really just builds the picture. And the same when you're presenting it at an interview of someone who's just really put in the time. Um, Okay, so I'm just looking at the comments. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave the questions for the end. I'm just gonna, in fact, what I think I'll do is I'll save the questions for the end for people who wanna unmute and speak because um, yeah, it's just a bit easier to do it that way. Okay, so that's shadowing. Shadowing is essentially, like I say, other than keeping a diary to remind yourself what you've done, it's almost like a tick, you can tick that off, right? It's something that you do, you get your 80 hours. Of course, if you wanna do more, it's a great experience, but ultimately it's kind of something that you complete. The other two things are volunteering and paid work. Now, volunteering is all about little and often. So you want to just show regular commitment of something. Even now, you can still, you know, by the time you get to interview, you can still have gained probably a good six to nine, you know, almost coming up to 10 months of, of, of good uh, volunteering experience. And this is all about being able to care for others, giving back to society, showing you that the kind of person that has empathy and cares and wants to offer up their health and, and essentially be sure that you're virtuous, right? Then paid work is, again, it's about little and often. You don't have to, everything that I say here is about balance between having enough to have experience to talk about, but also at the same time, not doing so much that you're taking time away from what you should be focusing on and prioritizing, which is the medical application. But the reason paid work is a fantastic thing is because it, the other two really, you know, when you're volunteering a little bit, you relied upon and, and shadowing, you're not contributing anything. So really like it doesn't matter whether you're there or not, but paid work is all about responsibility and transferable skills. So responsibility, you know, you need to turn up to work and they are relying on you. And you know, if you don't turn up, then the job doesn't get done and, and that puts people in the lurch. And medicine, uh, you know, there's nothing more motivating about medicine that when you wake up in the morning and you think, oh, you know what, I feel a bit rubbish today. I don't, I don't feel like going in, that being like, well, actually, you know, patients could actually really suffer if, if I don't go to, to work and do my job and they will be, be left in the lurch. And that is a very conscious thing that you need to be aware of. Um, and, and like I say, it will keep you, keep you honest. Um, so, and then the other thing with paid work is transferable skills. So uh, think about, it can be any job, it, literally, if you are trusted to handle money or trusted with the keys. So that shows that you are responsible. If you are, for example, let's say um, you're, you're working as a, a waiter or waitress and you have complaints like all, all the time in hospital patients get upset that they're unwell and you know they're not happy sometimes they're not happy with their care rightly or wrongly and you have to deal with you know disgruntled customers uh, or disgruntled patients in the, uh, in the comparison so it's all about handling difficult communication scenarios and all that sort of stuff you can think of a myriad of um traits and skills that you develop in most jobs that you can transfer to medicine. So that is in a nutshell, how I would think about work experience. Um, and just remember, ultimately, it's not what you do, it's what you get out of it. And um, I'd say that let's move on to the next subject. Um, I can take questions on work experience at the end. Um, but I would really recommend watching that video that I talked about here. So just um, if you look on the channel, I think it's called um, the, 
um, the ultimate guide to work experience or something like that. But if you just go on the channel and type work experience, look for this thumbnail, you'll be able to find it. Okay, the big one. Should we say, I wonder whether we should save this for the end. Um, yeah, let's talk, let's talk about the other stuff first, because I think we will save, because UCAT's going to be a big one. Um, so, um, again, this is a video that's going to help you choose your medical schools. Now, the only thing that I will say with medical school selection is that it is really important to choose medical schools. Oh, thank you. And um, so Arthur's just put in the chat uh, the video. I'm guessing it's the video about work. In this video, I'm going to... Yeah, there we go. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, here, so with, with med school selection, um, you, like I say, you can take two almost on paper identical students and you send the applications to four different universities and obviously it's the same for dentistry um you know you take the same people and depending on where you go will really determine on the success that they have and you know every year we get countless people come to us who uh come to our to our program for help because they didn't get in the year before and they come to us for help with the sometimes you know it's their third attempt fourth attempt the the highest we've had is someone who had five failed attempts and then came to us and we got them in on their sixth and it's simple things like this to understanding your strengths your um where you know where your application is strong what universities suit you and choosing four universities that are going to give you the best chance of success i mean for us this takes a this is a long process we take hours sitting down with each individual and choosing them choosing these universities for them but you need to look at, at the universities and kind of really bear in mind what do they prefer do they are they heavy on ucat waiting or do they use the personal statement and value work experience more um then we um sorry um it, uh, questions in the chat I'll, I'll answer very shortly hold on um so yeah basically do they value work experience do they do they look at the personal statement some universities like kings will actually put a lot of value on both the ucat and your personal statement i.e how much work experience you've got so they count it quite a lot whereas others will not look at it at all so you really need to bear that in mind, like Kiel, for example, they will have a roles and responsibilities form where they'll ask you to kind of um, write out the number of hours that you spent on somewhere. Again, this is somewhere that does look at hours uh, and they will ask you to say what the role was, talk, describe the responsibilities and they want to see different areas. So they'll say like one way you were um, caring for patients, one way you demonstrated leadership, one way you did this. And that's why it's good to have a variety where you can say, well, actually in this volunteering role, I showed this, whereas in this paid job, I did this. And that's why having a variety really helps. Um, but so this is where you, you have to look at how your, your application fares and, and how your, um, you know, where your strengths within your application lie. You know, it goes down to being even more granular as to, some people, some universities will look at how, what people got in the verbal reasoning, or some will be like, what did they get in the SJT? Or, the, you know, the, there are certain things with, that each university is look at. And this is why you have to really dissect your application and, and where you're strong and find the universities that suit. And like I said, this is why it's such a long process for people on our program. Um, for, so how do I apply? How do you apply for the program? Um, I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so yeah, in, so on the, on the vein of um, med school selection, on the website you can have a look at uh, where is it the med school comparison, and there's also and just off the screen on this second row you've got a application guide for both uh, grad and undergrad. So have a look at that. Um, so personal statement, um, let's see. So I'll talk about personal statement. Let me see if I've got any polls that I can just give myself a quick break to have a quick drink. Well, uh, I don't think we've got any personal statement. All right, talk to me. Let's just, let's just quickly ask in the chat. Um, how are people getting on with their personal statement? Maybe let's say, um, 
So put an N for not started, put a S for started, a D for your first draft, and an F for finished. So started, so not started, we've got a lot that haven't started. Uh, draft, some, some people say, okay, so I'd say probably about, so it looks like about 40% haven't started. One per, only one person seems to have finished it. Um, mo so yeah, so maybe half actually have not started. Some, and then out of the rest, I'd say it's probably about 50-50 between started and have their first draft done, which is fair enough. Okay, does anyone have any questions about the personal statement specifically? No? Okay, no problem. So, when you write any personal statement, and firstly, let's, so, um, so, so one of the questions is what do medical schools look for? Um, so a very intelligent way of going about it is going on the websites of the unis that you're thinking of and looking at some of the traits that they're looking for and basing your narrative of your personal statement around those. Now, um, with the personal statement, don't worry if you haven't written it yet, because like a lot of people have said, they're conducting a lot of their work experience over the summer. And very likely, some of the experiences that you gain will make it into the, will be from runners for the, because people will have a list of things that they could include in their personal statement. And that's, if you're keeping a diary and you're doing that, that's what should be the case. And a lot of that list will be made up of things that you're about to experience in your upcoming work experience. So, you know, a lot, and really what you're doing with all those experiences is essentially, Again, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, you're kind of saying, well, I want to talk a little bit about leadership. So this is a great one for that. And, um, you know, I want to talk about, uh, I don't know, um, some, something that I've done that's, that's outstanding. I want to show that I understand about uh, putting patients first and, you know, patient-centered care. So I'll use this experience. And you'll kind of fit it in like that. But also you'll be ranking all of your experiences and, and saying like, well, actually, this is the one that is really fantastic. I learned a lot from this and this is a great experience. I definitely want to make sure that's in there and so on and so forth. So it's a bit of a, a puzzle for what's the, what are, what are the quote unquote, quote unquote best, um, the best experiences? What are the things that fit into the narrative that I want to weave? So yeah, lots of, lots of things to consider. Um, so let me just go through a couple of questions. Give me a second. Um, what experiences do I include of, of those I have. So it kind of touched on that with kind of best in terms of the, the most insightful and again, um, that fit that those traits that you want to demonstrate. Um, should I mention how long you've been doing a few things? So the, the length of time I would say is always, if it's really long, then I would recommend doing it. If you've shown, because let's say you've been, I don't know, uh, you've done a sport for 10 years and you've shown commitment and dedication and uh, you've shown signs of being outstanding and excelling in that, then yeah, say I've been doing it for 10 years, that, that you can make a direct comparison for the commitment to that, to the commitment to a lifelong career in medicine. So then, then if, it's, if it's a bit short and you think, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't actually, it's a great thing, but I've not been doing it that long, then there's no obligation to include the time. Just say, I, I, I regularly, so let's say you started your volunteering two weeks ago and, you know, in, in, let's say a month or two's time when you, when you finished your personal statement, it, I would just say, I regularly volunteer at my local hospice, blah, 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 blah. You don't need to say anything about the time. Um, and yeah, when they, and one of, one of those things is that when it comes to these, all these things that you are starting now, you should continue until at least until after interviews, because the, when they get to in, when you get to interview, one of the first questions will be, "Oh, okay, you, you do this volunteering," and they might ask, "When did you start?" and you'll tell them the truth. But then, and you'll say, "And I've been doing it for the last six months." By then, it will be probably even more, maybe even nine, ten months. So they want to see that you're not just saying it 
just to tick a box on a CV. They want to see that you're continuing to do it. So it doesn't matter in the personal statement how long you've been doing stuff for, but make sure that you're continuing it if you're going to put it. Um, so for work experience, I had done quite a bit three years ago. Does that still count? So again, uh, Warwick is a great resource for that. Um, some universities, again, it's just about what you want, um, sorry, what you got out of it and just showing that you care. But to be honest, I think, so Warwick will say no, that, that wouldn't count. You'd have to get all of the experience again. But to be honest, even, even aside from the technicalities of whether it counts or doesn't, you know, if someone wants to be a doctor, I would, I would hope that they would do something now to have something fresh, right? Not, be, not just because it will give you some more stuff to talk about and it will be clear, you know, more recent in your memory. So you'll be able to tell better stories about it in, in like I say, in your personal statement and in your interview. But you know, if you're the kind of person that wants to be a doctor, you should have done something fairly recently. You shouldn't be like, oh, I've got this thing from all this time ago. Um, let's try and, you know, get the most, squeeze the most juice out of that. We should be doing regular things if we, if we're interested in it. And if we're serious about building a good application, we should have current stuff. Um, how many pages should the person say it be? So it's 4,000 characters, correct? Yeah, thank you, T. Um, um, okay, so I'm reapplying, I wanted to ask, um, can I make edits to my personal statement or should I write a new? Yeah, you can, you can submit exactly, you can't plagiarize yourself, right? Um, you can, um, you, I, I mean, you're the same person who's had the same life <laughs> and all you've, all you've done is you're a year later. I would obviously make improvements to your personal statement. I'm sure the, the number of personal statements I get um, that have been submitted in previous years and, you know, really are not particularly great it is quite a lot. I mean, I make a lot of changes to personal statements when I get them because I, there's, I have quite a high standard for them and yeah, a lot of people don't reach that standard. So um, it's, um, yeah, I, I would always argue that you can, there's room for improvement. So I would build some more experience on your old personal statement and then, um, yeah, have a think, well, have a think about writing it um, again. Well, not writing it again, but adapting what you have. Um, okay. Right, let's move on. So in terms of structuring the personal statement, I mean, I, you know, on the program, I literally do, you know, we, we do several, multi, multiple, several hour workshops on this. And, you know, we sit down and really hash out all of this stuff with people. But to give you a rough guide to so this 4,000 characters uh, with spaces, that is, and I think it's 27 lines, whichever comes first. And I would say as a rough guide, so this is not a hard, you know, don't worry if it's not exactly this, but I would divide it roughly into six and I would roughly allocate, you know, the relative six of this word character count, should I say, into these areas, right? So two sixths, so a third on why a doctor, and I'll show you how to sandwich that later, well, in a, in a moment. Um, what you've done to show you're committed to a career in medicine. And this is where it's like, you know, your work experience, your volunteering. I'd also include your paid work here. I probably should have added that. And wider reading and study, which is any books, any um, lectures you've attended, any uh, courses, all that sort of stuff, any art, just articles, whatever it is to demonstrate your commitment. And then finally, your extracurricular stuff. So these are like the traits and things that make you outstanding, the things that make you suited to a career in medicine. So again, you can like this one can be up to a quarter. So this is why I'm saying it's not like a hard and fast rule. It's just just a rough guide to help you kind of think about where to start with allocating your character count. So let's start with why a doctor. Um, always a great uh, <laughs> opening to a personal statement. Um, you know, the reason I want to study medicine is blah, blah, blah. Um, and then that leads into usually your work experience. Um, again, I'll just, I'll just say, because this is something I could spend, you know, three hours on just talking about now. I would say there's a playlist on our 
on our YouTube channel that you can check out with um, lots of free stuff. And like I say, it's stuff that we, we have, um, you know, hours of workshops on to kind of get right. But I'm just going to give you the overview here. Um, so then go into your work experience. Um, any, so any of these points, I really want you to follow the format of what you did, what you got out of it, and why that relates to you being a good doctor. So, you know, from, for one of my shadowing experiences, I went, let's use the hernia, the um, example of the hernia. Uh, so for one of my work experiences, I went and shadowed a surgeon, uh, a general surgeon in, um, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really name drop the hospital. So I went and shadowed a general surgeon. In that I saw um, one emergency patient who had a strangulated hernia. So that's when the gut, someone has a hernia, the gut gets caught and it gets blocked. Um, and they did an emergency operation to relieve it and place a mesh in there to uh, prevent further um, further herniation. Um, it, what, what struck me most was the surgeon's ability to remain calm under pressure and remain methodical in their approach. It taught me the importance of 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 being having a steady nerve. So I'm just riffing here, so it's kind of not coming out as fluent. And um, of of holding my nerve when in a stressful situation, and the importance of remaining calm. I and then this is where you would the the really so that's your point, right? That's the what I did, what I got out of it, and how it relates back to, to me being a great doctor. Now, then the really pro move is to then link that experience into the next experience. So I carried, uh, I tried to emulate those skills in my volunteering work where I had to care for people in a hospice. And that also has a lot of stressful situation, which also has a lot of stressful situations. And then you can talk about another experience and another skill that you learned. And it's just transitioning from like, I picked this up. I, I thought that this was really important. I carried that skill forward into the next thing. And actually, you, in, when you talk about the next thing, you're going to talk about a completely different point. But you are kind of using that as a transition to show that you're um, implementing that skill. You, you understanding the importance of it and then putting it into practice in your everyday life. So, um, sorry, I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent on the um, granular structure. So this is the broad structure of how I would go about it, but on a granular like, point level, so in the, think of the, uh, the person's statement as scoring points and each kind of combination of those things, what you did, what you got out of it and how it make you a good doctor, that's almost like one point, right? So on a granular level, that's how I would go about um, structuring those points within this broader structure. So then, yeah, the next thing we'll talk about is volunteering, wider reading, and then again, extracurricular can be a little bit beefier. This is all about like, why you're a great person, what you've achieved so far, all the traits that you've developed, and then finish off with a great conclusion that summarizes it. No new points here, reiterating all of the great things that make you a good doc, that make you a good candidate to become a doctor, and just reiterating why you want to do this. Um, okay. So, um, talk about, let's talk about the UCAT now. Um, again, yeah, like I say, on the website, there are plenty of subject, so the friendly free resources and the YouTube channel as well. Let's talk about the UCAT. So, um, Let's, let's see if I've got any polls ready made to talk to ask you guys about. Okay, let's ask you some. So firstly, oh, hold on, let me just finish the last poll. Um, and where's the poll that I currently have? Just bear with me one second. Stop sharing. Okay, so I've realised that the poll's been sharing that whole time. Um, okay, so. Let's do, let's talk about UCAT. So firstly, how important do we think the UCAT is? So 
Okay, that's well, been cast. Let's give it 10 more seconds. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, let's close it. So, um, people think the UK is very important. And I would, I, would, I would agree. It's not the number one most important factor. There are, they all matter. We only remember we talked about the, um, the jigsaw puzzle and the, this and the interview are two big pieces. But remember that what, what I get a lot of um, for people coming to me for help is that they get to interview, but they don't get past interview. So, so um, they'll they'll get four interview offers, right? And they'll have they'll attend four interviews and not get a single offer. And that's because a lot of people think that it's just about getting a good score in the UK, and that's all that matters. And the thing that will the thing that that will lead to is that you will get. Again, the, you know, you will get through all the hurdles. You will, if you've got, as long as you meet the eligibility criteria, you'll get through the hurdles for some of the universities, and they'll, and they'll get you in front of the panel. And then, because you haven't acquired the skills by putting in the time of all the other stuff, uh, getting to know the profession, doing the work experience, um, you know, choosing the right medical schools and writing a nice personal statement, all that other stuff. They will just be like, oh, okay, this person's essentially just someone who's <clears throat> scored well on a test and they're not actually a good candidate. So it's important to present yourself, as we said, as the full package, right? So the, yes, the UCAT is a very important part. And, uh, you know, the, the opposite side to that is that if you do well in all the other things, but neglect, neglect the aptitude tests, you know, we're talking about the UCAT now, but, you know, I, talk, I mean, I'm talking about GAMSAT, uh, BMAT as well. If you have a great application, but you don't get the required score in this, then you know you won't get to interview. So you, you need to have both, right? But what I'm saying is, don't um, don't prioritize one at the expense of the other. Remember about it's about being rounded. So let's do another poll. And um, there's two questions. There are two questions in this one. So on a scale of one to ten, how clear are you about the exam format, best techniques, and how you should prepare? And the second question is on a scale of high, one being the highest, five being the lowest, how worried are you about the UCAT? So yeah, so one, one is very worried. Five is not worried at all. And then the other one is, <laughs> the first question is, one is the, are you very clear? Five is you not clear at all. So I'll give you a little bit longer to answer. Another five seconds. Okay, let's share the results for this as well. So generally people have a, well, let's, let's say a mediocre understanding. Some people seem to be very clear about 14%, about a fifth of you are reasonably clear, I would say, and then most people are in the middle that they they feel they're not well, you know not unclear but not too clear. So for the people that are in the middle, what is it? What what are the bits that you're not clear about? Is it the format, the techniques, how you should prepare? Let's let's kind of hone in on on what it is specifically that we want to focus on now. So pop that in the chat. Then um, on a scale of um, one to, one to five. Uh, how worried are you about the UCAT? So just near almost half, 45% are, um, are one out of five, as in like number one most worried you can be. So very worried. And then some some people are a five. So about a seventh of you are um, not so worried, which is great. Um, but most people, I would say, you know, about 60%, well, over 60%, about two thirds of you, in fact, are in the very worried or or slightly worried okay cool so let's should we do any more we've got more polls let's do one more poll just so that we can oh i think my mouse has decided to stop working uh, um just give it a second it's reconnecting there we go um let's launch this last one just so we can get a bit more of a direction on where we should take this conversation so what is the most common cause 
for students achieving a poor UCAT score. So is it difficulty of questions? Is it poor accuracy and silly mistakes? Is it incorrect technique, running out of time, underestimating the exam? Okay, so good. I'll give it another 10 seconds. I'm just, I'm just going through your comments so I can work out what to, to focus on. Again, just like the personal statement, this is something that I could spend <laughs> 20 hours explaining all of this stuff. So I'm just gonna try to give you like my, my greatest hits, so to speak. Okay, right, I think everybody who's gonna vote has voted now. So uh, let's end the poll. So here people feel that the most, uh, the most common cause for students achieving poor UCAT score now, of course, all of these matter, but I would say that the number one correctly, as people have guessed, is running out of time. Um, I mean, incorrect tech. So, so, I mean, running out of time is a symptom of incorrect technique, right? But, and poor accuracy and silly mistakes is another symptom of incorrect technique. Underestimating the exam is a broader pr before getting to the exam thing. And like I say, it's it's weirdly underestimated in that they don't appreciate how fast how fast paced it is um but then again new people who are coming to a talk like this are the people who really you know what you're letting yourselves in for and you just want to make sure that you can maximize your time and you know we get a lot of people you know, on our on our program you know what what people don't understand is that the, the techniques are teachable and the improve you can improve by having good and a good strategy game plan approach techniques you know again just to give you an idea of kind of what you can achieve we get again as i said before every year we'll get people who come to us didn't do well in didn't, didn't get in once twice three times sometimes more and we can take their ucat score from you know, average, so like 2,500 is about the average, but some people have got 2,400, 2,300, and we can take them to a 3,000. It, it really, it does happen. And it's all about, you know, thinking about the strategy, the techniques, the, the way that you approach the exam and just understanding the, the importance of pace. So yeah, it's really common for us to have that where we've taken people from, crap scores, well not crap scores, but not great scores to getting a 3000 plus. And if, you, if you've seen any of my other talks on specifically on getting a 3000 plus in the UCAT, which you can check on again on the YouTube channel, there are loads of, of talks there, but um, getting a three, the, uh, the 3000, it's a nice round number, but it's kind of like a magical number in that it will help you take control of the application. It become the whole mentality that I have when I'm teaching my students is it's not about it's not about you begging them <laughs> to offer you a place it's about them wanting you right you want to be the kind of candidate that you go in you, you you've smashed the the UCAT you've done great experience and that translates to writing a really good personal statement then you've chosen a, 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 well when you're in that sort of position in fact you get the pick of the litter with the med schools. And that's the, that's the best thing when you're thinking, well, actually, you know, I'm in a position now where I've done so well in all of these that I know that I'm gonna be in front of an interview panel. And then when you get there, they're like, wow, this person's the real deal. They, they present well, at, they carry themselves well at interview, which again is a really important part as well. They have all the, the they tick all the boxes and you, we see it, you know, with our students there, the universities are kind of being like, we want you and they will give you a really low offer sometimes i mean that that's rare but essentially they're in the interview they're trying to be like they're trying to sell the the university to the student because they've done so well so um you know it really is a reframe when you're nailing all of these elements so let's talk a little bit about so for for all of these let's let's focus on ucat because that's the one that's most imminent. But for any of these exams, um, I have something like this basically for all of the all of them. So I've got a whole playlist for UCAT on, on the channel. I've got a whole playlist for GAMSAT on the channel and I've got one for, for BMAT as well. And 
it's basically going to teach you how to think about timings, how to think about um, the, um, the like how to think about the approach and how you're going to just prepare to, to do well. So the thing that you need to think about with the the UK is first the first thing. In fact, have I got the steps here? So I'll talk I'll talk you through the steps. The first one is familiarization. So first, you need to understand what the questions are, what the um, best techniques are, what the speediest techniques are, how to navigate all of those questions so that you've got that knowledge in the bank. And it's almost like um, getting to the stage where it's a reflex. It's like, I see this type of question, I deploy this card. The thing that I saw somebody say earlier in the chat is that the UCAT is unlike anything that they've revised for before. And that's because it, it's a, an exam unlike anything else. It's a performance. It's not a knowledge-based test. So when you do I don't know, your history exam, you go away and you learn a load of stuff. And then you sit down to the exam and they say, tell me what you know about this. And then you, in the best way possible, present what you know. Maths is the same, you know, you go away and learn how to um, you know, do differential um, uh, simultaneous equations or, you know, you learn how to differentiate or integrate um, uh, equations and all of that stuff. And then they say, sit down and uh, and do this, right? And like regurgitate your knowledge. Whereas this is actually more, a bit more, to be fair, with the maths example, the UCAT is a bit more like that. It's a bit like, we want to see that you have these skills. Now, we want you to apply those skills. So it's really more of a performance than it is a test. So they're not asking you for dates. They're not asking you to remember stuff. They just want you to go in and they'll present some questions to you and they and they want you to very quickly work your way through those questions and have a good level of accuracy and the reason the reasoning behind them testing all these different things is for example verbal reasoning when you get patients notes you don't have time to go sit down and read them like you would a book you need to extract the important information through reading through stuff really quickly or skim reading and, and being able to understand the important salient features same with arithmetic, you need to be able to do quick arithmetic so that if you're doing drug calculations or if you're just working out any, there are a number of um, numerical calculations in medicine, they want to see that you can do it quickly and accurately. Same with, um, with logic, so the decision making is all about logic. They want to see that you're ethical with the situational judgment. So they want to see that you're the kind of person that can weigh up all of these different features the abstract reasoning is more about like thinking outside the box right so and recognizing patterns which you get a lot in medicine as well so so the first so one of the questions earlier was what resources i, I would i mean I, I am biased obviously but every year i get you know every you know in high season of the UCAT, every day i will get a comment on youtube or an email or somebody who reaches out to me to say thank you for the UCAT course that I have um, and how useful it's been for them to to do that, to use that as their revision tool. Um, you know, like I say, I'm totally biased, so <laughs> um, you can take what I say with a pinch of salt, but um, I think our, our UCAT course is still absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, I'll link to it now if you'd like, but um, yeah, so I would, I'd recommend checking that out as your this is just your baseline resource, right? This is just going to give you the foundations because we're still talking about phase one, um, yeah, phase one of preparation. Then let me call it step one because I don't want you to get confused with the four phase, the four phases of the med school application. So step one is familiarization. Number two is untimed practice. So you can do it on the UCAT website and there's Medify, Medentry, lots of, oh, someone's got, your course is amazing. Oh, thank you for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, the, so, so then you need to practice, you need to put these techniques into practice. And the first thing is to do it unpressured. So take the time, to take the timer off, do them untimed and just really use that to, um, yeah, use that to just familiarize yourself and get used to, to doing these techniques without the pressure so again those are the resources that i would use for that the thing that i will say just to take a step back and kind of 
uh, speak broadly about this is that the I would I would do everything on a computer so that all the resources that you're using like often I get asked about books the the thing with all of this is if you if you are someone who learns who likes book learning then great but the thing is it's on that the exam is on a computer everything is computer based and at some point you're going to have to make the transition from book to computer so I think you know if you're used to book learning you might as well start computer learning from the start with with an online course rather than learning it all from a book and then having to when you're practicing questions going back and being like it's it's really jarring to go from the two so i would say um yeah i would say start with a computer from from the off um so then so like i say practice questions and time and then it's all about getting yourself exam ready now this is again right now i talk about crunch time for the application this is crunch time for the the ucat and again you can apply the very same thing to the gamsat um and again i have a um a really good guide for that um now um when you're trying to up your speed it's really important to um essentially just do it very gradually and understand that this is the bit that is quite stressful for people so when we talk about you know time to prepare for some people they can do it in two or three weeks for some people it takes two or three months and it's not the same for everybody and people progress at different rates but what i would do is have a goal and so just before you're about to start step three which is to do time practice what i would say is it's really helpful to do an untimed one and work out what really you should be doing untimed until you're getting about 80 percent correct and then that's the time to move on to, to time practice now when you have when you do um, your last un, untimed one find out how long it takes you so although you're not being again you know working against the clock still time it so that you know how long it takes you to do it and then you kind of need to work out where you want to be and again this is down to what universities you want to go to and blah 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 uh, i mean i would always aim for be aiming for 3000 and that's like i say kind of what we do with our students so then you need to work out okay so let's say i'm doing untimed i'm getting like the equivalent of 2700 and i want to get to three or maybe even so if you're getting 80 percent, you're probably in the 2800 region so what we want to do is essentially let's say it takes me let's, let's do it by a individual um like a, in an individual section so quantitative reasoning it's uh, off the top of my head i can't remember the exact time but let's call it 26 minutes or something um so let's say you're you need to get you want to get a 700 or 750 right and you manage to get 750 you manage to get your untimed at 750 and you manage to do it in 34 minutes right so what you want to do is so you want to do 34 minutes and then you want to set the timer to 32 minutes to do that in and you want to just do that until you get used to it and that you're kind of getting similar sort of scores then you want to go down to 30 minutes and keep going until you get the same sort of scores then keep keep edging it down until you're getting at the pace and you're getting the same result at the pace that you're that is the real exam time and that's how you kind of like close the gap and slowly just um just gradually get towards the same score that you had in lesser time um and yeah and, so, and abdullah saying i've never reached higher than 650 well that's also fine what we wanted so you also kind of want to get used to getting a decent score 650 is a great score still um you you want to get used to getting that sort of score at the, the the normal time so whatever the exam real time is and then you can worry about getting better and, and fat well, get getting higher accuracy because once you get used to that pace you you will actually feel like you have a little bit more time 
to just stop and think and, and take a beat on things. So that's one element that I would think about in terms of preparing. Again, this is something that you know, we spend ages with our students on, on, our, on um, especially on the academy program. Um, and we could spend a long time discussing and you know checking people's individual technique and what they're doing and how they're approaching it and blah 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 so i'm just kind of giving you the like the broad concepts here then the other thing that i um would recommend is is for the concept of focusing on one particular section at a time because what a lot of people do is they'll do five set in in a day's practice they'll try and do all five sections and really let me see if i've got that book to hand that i always i always show a diagram from um uh, one of the books on my bookshelf uh i can't see it so i won't bore you with me looking for it but basically um i, I refer to it in one of the video, one of my videos on youtube that you can have an inch of progress in five di in five directions or by just putting intense focus on one um, one of the sections, you can have massive increase. And what tends to happen is that you kind of reach thresholds. This is why when people, you know, people in the in the questions earlier were saying, oh, "I'm really struggling with um, with uh, you know, I'm really struggling to improve my scores. They're staying the same." What happens is people plateau. So it'll go, you know, you'll improve a bit. And then you'll plateau for a bit and then you'll jump you'll kind of cross the threshold and then you'll improve more and then you'll plateau there and it, so you've got to bear in mind that progress isn't linear now that's one element the other thing to bear in mind is that you, uh, of, once you kind of reach certain thresholds you tend to not fall too far behind uh, far underneath them so for, i'll give you an example when i was um what was i 18 I so before that I so let's let's go back even further when I was 14 I started snowboarding and um I'd go every year and I'd do a week and every year I'd go back and I was sl slightly worse than the year before because I'd not practiced in that time so I'd spend the first three days getting to re recovering to the level I was in the previous year and then I spend probably the next three days kind of slightly improving and then I'd go away again and then I'd come back next year and again the same would happen I'd spend the first three days trying to get back to the previous level I was so then each time I'm only just inching forward a little, little bit more in my progress whereas the when I was 18 I went and did a snowboarding season and learned to be an instructor and in that time I spent I think it was 10 weeks 12 weeks of intense every day snowboarding every day every day and you know as you can imagine you, you grow exponentially you get you get very good very quickly and the thing is with that is that no matter i mean after lockdown i've not been snowboarding for probably about three years now and probably more and i know though even though i've not been for all that time i'm never gonna go beneath a certain level i'm always going to be all right okay maybe i might feel a little bit rusty but when i go back i'll be still way better than those five cumulative weeks so you kind of hit a certain level of being good. And a lot of you probably have experience with this. It's like people who did 10 years of piano as a kid, and they may not have touched the piano for five years, but they sit down and they'll just instantly be quite good. Again, they'll be rusty, but they'll have hit a certain threshold that really they'll always be decent at it. And it's the same sort of thing with, with when you focus on each individual UCAT section at a time, obviously on a very small time scale, but we are, you know, if you focus on one thing at a time, you get it really good and, it, and you just have to maintain it. I always use the analogy of spinning plates, get it to a certain level. And then all you have to do is every few days, just come back to it, do a little bit to maintain it. And you'll, you'll just kind of keep it at that level while you're focusing on other areas to have intense focus on and improve those areas so so that single-mindedness intense focus on one section at a time will result in more improvement than just again inching forward slightly in all five sections simultaneously if that makes sense um other than that let me just think of any other things that we might want to talk about I guess in terms of individual sections and individual techniques, I would say if you go on my YouTube channel, 
um, that I basically break down my like four or five best videos for all of the for all the individual sections. And again, it kind of just gives you a bit of a taste of what we're doing when we're teaching our students one on one. Um, so I'd, so if you've got a particular section that you're struggling on, I'd recommend just going and watching those videos and they'll be really helpful as a, as a starting point. Okay, cool. So um, does anybody have any other questions regarding UCAT stuff? Let's do um, let's do unmute and, and chat because uh, it'll save my voice a little bit. Anyone? We can do chat if you want, I don't mind, but um, yeah, it'd be nice to hear another human speak. Deborah? Oh, sorry, Deborah, it's, it's really quiet. I can't hear that well. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? A little bit better, yeah. You know, when you say to practice on time until you get 80%, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you're practicing, do you do all the sessions together or you should practice one with verbal reasoning, reach 80%? Yeah, I'd, again, yeah, same thing. I would be practicing sections at a time. I think that would be, give you the best chance of improving. So, you know, I would, yeah, I would, I would think like, you know, say if you're doing an online course to do, do the verbal reasoning go away do some practice questions and um, you, you kind of like dip between the different phase the different stages right so i wouldn't like so i would maybe do verb do verbal reasoning learning go and put it into practice okay maybe untimed you may be getting i don't know 60 percent, and then you do a little bit more you maybe get it up to 70 percent and I wouldn't spend too long on it. Next day, I would go and do the, the next section, learn a little bit about it, go and do some in-time practice questions, see how much you can improve it. And then, you know, maybe go through all of those that like, that way. But then obviously when you come back and do uh, another focused bit of time on verbal reasoning, you don't really need to go back and do phase stage one again, because you've done all of the theory. It, you might need to maybe there's like one area that you think, oh, I'm not so clear on that. So maybe I'll go back and review that bit, but you don't really need to start stage one again. So you'll kind of be doing um, untimed practice a lot, and then you probably get that to 80%. And then you think, okay, cool. I'm ready to move on to timed. And then you move on to that and the other area. It's a, this is that thing of like spinning plates, right? So it's like, okay, this one, I'm kind of at this level, this section, I'm kind of at this stage. and. You can kind of use those um in fact again another video that i did is the retrospective timetable where you can just essentially keep track of how you're progressing in each and get a good idea uh, verbal reasoning for example 80 percent in the verbal reasoning if you got 80 percent on the exam verbal reasoning you'd be absolutely smashing it so you know you can tailor it a little bit to when you think like okay i'm i'm not quite hitting the 80 percent but I'm ready now to, to move on to time questions. So it's a little bit of, you know, just sometimes it's just a case of getting down and doing it and getting your head down and doing it and just working out as you go along, kind of what, you know, tailoring that approach. This is why it's, sometimes it's a bit difficult to give really generic advice because like I say, this is something that on our, on our program, we spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with, with people going through this sort of stuff. Um, so someone's saying about, is anyone using a Mac? Um, wondering if it's worth getting a normal keyboard and to plug and get used to the calculator. I always always say like the, um, the test centers are really old school. They have like really old fashioned computers. And um, so what I say is I would, I would definitely do a mock. I, would, I mean, I would do several mocks. Um, you know, we, we do regular mocks with our students just to keep track of where they are. But I would say if you're going to do a mock, maybe like treat it like an exam, like treat it like a full mock, treat, really mimic the exam. So go to go to the local library, 
do it there and sit down and treat it like you know it's game day so to speak and um really put effort into it as if it is the real thing and that will help you get used to you know kind of like the nerves and doing it on a different computer but also in relation to kind of how it works with the keyboard shortcuts as well that will be a lot more similar to what the actual thing will be like um in terms of hours so this is again something that's very personal um but i would always so the exam's two hours right and i always describe it as a mental sprint it's like high intensity uh fast paced, lots of, you know, a bit of an assault on the, on the brain. And so what I would recommend is, you know, the exam's two hours, so just get used to doing two hour sprints, right? So, and this is when, more when you're doing the step stage three, where it's like quite intense, but um, yeah, think of it, think of them, think of your training in like two hour, tokens of two hour slots. So the, the analogy, the reason I, I say it's a bit like sprint, uh, like a sprint is because when people train for sprint training, what they do is instead of like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of sprinting nonstop um, and thinking that that's going to help because over time, well, very, very quickly, in fact, you're going to run out of gas and your speed is going to reduce. So it's a very good comparison to the UCAT where your speed reduces and that affects your score, right? What they do in sprinting is that they'll do really short bursts. So they might do a 50 meter sprint. They might do a hundred meter sprint, but they'll do like short sprints and then take massive breaks. So they might have like, they might sprint for 10 seconds and, and take two minutes, three minutes rest. And it's a bit like that. So just think of it as short bursts with long rests as well, because what I get a lot of messages from, from people, like a lot of YouTube comments and messages from people is that like, I'm spending all this time trying to improve my UCAT score and I'm actually getting worse. And it's because you're knackered and you're, it's like, again, you know, it's, it's like trying to, you've you've put loads of hours into it and then trying to get someone to get you to do loads of mental arithmetic at speed when you're already tired you need to come in when you're fresh and then you need to rest and then you need to come back and that's the way you get stronger versus being really tired getting a bad score getting demoralized thinking oh i've got to come back again when you're even more tired and that's when it's like the, vir the a vicious cycle rather than a virtuous cycle um Um, again, Tay, it's very personal. So Tay or, or T, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so for the UCAT, how many weeks before test day, uh, should you start using the UCAT website resources? Um, I'd say again, it's very personal to you. You know, it can be anything. So it, it's, it depends what stage you're at and where, um, yeah, where, where you are with everything. So um, I think we've prob I think we've got another session going on for our students. So I'll I'll answer some more questions. But just before I do that, what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about the program because we do have a few places that have just freed up. Um, we're very oversubscribed at the moment, so we've got it's, it's application to get onto the program. But if you have a look here. Uh, on this, um, on the link in, in the chat, or if you go to this page of the website, the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and um, you can see how we can help you. And, you know, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one tutoring with, with students, and we do lots of seminars, lots of workshops, lots of, loads of stuff like that. Um, and we, um, and we, like I say, we have a massive success rate, and we really help people and at this stage when people are a bit worried um you know it can be a bit make or break and a lot of the time what we'll do with our students is just help make it efficient so that you're spending your time on the right sort of things help you focus on the right areas give you the techniques and the tools to just really elevate your application and you know for a lot of people 
who come to us, they, um, you know, a lot of people who don't get in come to us and they see once we've kind of they've seen what we do and how we help people, they understand uh, why they didn't get in before and and really just how how much to you know how to elevate your application to that next level and give yourself a really good chance of getting in. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of cost, it's it's something that, that firstly we you know we, you have to apply and, and be successful with your application. It's something we discuss once you've once you've got through the application because it's um it's you know it's it depends on you and your situation really. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so Tay said that she wasn't able to apply. Okay, so so we, there is an application form. Just make sure you've read it properly and because and and filled out the answers properly and, and that maybe Tay, I'd recommend that you just try again. And if not, just email us on here and we can we can help you. But um, usually it's because they haven't read the questions properly and, and ticked all the boxes correctly because there are a lot of questions in there that are just checking um, to see whether you have, um, yeah, to, to see whether you've actually paid attention to the application and, and read it properly. Um, the, so the, 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 pr the pricing range is, is, is quite, quite a range it, it can de depend like I say it depends on your circumstances there's you know it's affordable there's, there's there are options for everybody really it depends how much support you need and want um and yeah uh, I'll, like I say don't worry just submit an application and we can chat to you on the call about uh, what it is you need and, and budget and all that sort of stuff um okay right I think we'll wrap it up there I think I'm about to get kicked off um here anyway so um what, what i'll say to everybody is best of luck with your application and um again if you ever need any help uh like i say really you know you can make a massive impact on your application and really make it stand out by applying these techniques that i've taught you and just doing it in the best way possible and really focus on this summer on just nailing all of these and you can make a really good application this summer will be a very very important part of the whole application and um yeah i just wish you guys all the best and um yeah if you want to um yeah well, I, like i say if you want some more stuff check out the the youtube channel but otherwise thank you for coming today and i hope you found that useful and um yeah hopefully see you either in the youtube comments or you know check out the social media stuff we do loads of great stuff on there um the TikTok is where we're putting a lot of energy into it on the kind of social side but the youtube channel is our is our main uh area where we give loads of useful help and of course if you want to apply to the program i'd love to see you there and wish you best of luck if you're submitting an application for the interview and all of that stuff but uh, other than that i hope you have a great day today and uh, yeah, see you soon. All right. Take care, guys.